So I'm Tiffany Williams. I'm the Associate Director here at IPS, but before I became the Associate Director, I ran our Break the Chain campaign project, which worked on labor trafficking of domestic workers for 14 years. Hi, I'm Samira Hafiz. I'm the Advocacy Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and we are housed here at IPS. And I, in my role at NDWA, uh, lead our anti-trafficking campaign, which Tiffany started, Beyond Survival, and I also work on our immigration campaign called We Belong Together. Great. Um, since John's not here, I suppose we need to go ahead and get started, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys. Um, so we're going to first start with sort of like a question and answer. Uh, I'm going to be asking the panel questions about some of the initiatives that have gone on between IPS and DWA. And then we're, at the end, we're going to open it up to the audience mm -hmm. to ask questions. But we're going to also invite the panelists to ask the audience questions, because we want to make this a dialogue rather than just sort of a one-way streak. Um, since John's out here, the first question is going to be for you, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. You just talked about the uh, Break the Chain campaign. Could you expound upon that a little bit? Just tell us, like, how did IPS get involved with it? How did it originate? Uh, just talk more about what that process looked like. So actually, I have this really cool um, artifact for you, um, <laughs> which was from 1995. That is how old this campaign is. Um, so Break the Chain was sort of, it was a project of um, this woman, Martha Honey, who worked here, and Sarah Anderson, who maybe will be around, um, and Joy Zaremka came on a bit after that. And it started after an expose in the city paper about the World Bank and how the World Bank um, employees were abusing domestic, domestic workers who came on these uh, special visas to work for that organization, the A3 and the G5 visa program. And after the story and after all the research that they did and the paper and the, the article that they wrote, they realized that there weren't actually any um, appropriate services for the domestic workers who they were meeting. There was no Trafficking Victims Protection Act at that time. Um, there were very few uh, resources. Many of them were homeless shelters or food banks and things that weren't particularly appropriate for trafficking survivors. So um, within the walls of this think tank, they decided to start a project. And normally, I would advise against such a thing. Um, but <laughs> they did hire a social worker and a lawyer and really tried to do it right um, and did culturally appropriate um, direct services for 14 years here in the district. And um, the project was one of the few and actually remained um, one of the few serving domestic workers specifically. Um, Polaris came on around the same time um, when, then as we were transitioning out to take over a lot of the work. Um, but for a long time, there were no services, particularly for African workers and South Asian workers. There were some services for Spanish-speaking workers across Maryland, but otherwise, uh, it was just us. Um, so in the late 2000s, we also started doing advocacy work. Um, and actually, the, the model of the, the program was really organizing and advocacy alongside the services. So if the problem was the World Bank, we would be in front of the World Bank. Um, leafleting and protesting and trying to get these policies changed so that the employers would treat the workers better and the State Department would fix the visas. And that is, as Samira will say later, an ongoing process, although we have had some victories over the years. Um, and so I think I'll, should I wait until later to talk about how we cooked up with NDWA? That, that's just the break the chain piece of it. Okay, yeah. Um, so then I'll just um, stop there and say that um, the model that we that we used here um, it is, has been replicated with other service organizations and it's something that we worked really hard to refine, meaning we always put client self-sufficiency and client self-determination first. Um, we talked a lot about political advocacy um, and political education, organizing, globalization, <laughs> migration, women's rights. Um, and all of those pieces as part of the services that we delivered. And um, our analysis of the sort of effectiveness of our work showed us that that kind of um, combination of services, advocacy, and organizing was the most effective for the workers to be able to move on after we were done with case management, especially since the government case management um, was so limited and still is, so uh, funding for case management. So it was important that we worked on self-sufficiency, which is why it was great to partner with NDWA, which I will get to later. Um, my next question is for Samira. First, let me say, um, 
I've looked at some of the policy work that you guys have done, and I've been incredibly impressed. And so this next question about how you personally got involved with NDWA and just sort of the origin story, like how did it come about, mm. what sort of initiatives do you guys care about and be working on? There's John. And yeah. how, what, where you guys see yourself going on in the future, we would love to hear more about that. Sure, thanks. Um, do you want to give John a chance or do you want me to? Uh, we can, we can come back to it. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. We're glad I, to have you. I'm 1230 and I know you switched it, so it's, but it's great to be here with you all. Thank you, Mark. Um, so NDWA was founded in 2007 and the National Domestic Workers Alliance works for the recognition, rights, and labor protections of domestic workers in the United States and beyond. Um, we do this through several kind of strategies. Uh, we do leadership development of women and color work, women of color worker leaders, and also uh, build capacity of grassroots organizations that are affiliates. We have 53 affiliates around the country. Uh, we also um, it, lead several campaigns, local, state, and national campaigns, in partnership with our affiliates. Um, some of our campaigns involve. Uh, winning state level rights for domestic workers. Uh, we've had success in six states so far and where federal labor protections um, don't uh, protect domestic workers, we've been able to create uh, rights in different states, New York, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, or sorry, not, yeah, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Oregon, Hawaii, and California. And they've been really effective in mobilizing domestic workers for state victories and increasing protections. Uh, we also have an immigration campaign where we've been trying to bring a gender lens to the immigration debate and elevate the voice of women and mobilize women around the country for policies that honor their needs and the needs of families. Um, and then we also have an anti-trafficking campaign that is powered by six of our affiliates from around the country. And these affiliates, uh, through their work in organizing domestic workers, have developed a lot of expertise in serving also survivors of trafficking. And it's one of the few um, only actually campaign that I know of, national campaign, that is focused on organizing survivors of trafficking. So most of the survivors that participate in our campaign are connected to um, service providers and um, organizations in their locality, but they work together with us on this national campaign to elevate their voices so their voices will be leading the anti-trafficking movement. Mm -hmm. um, so your question, I think, was what brought me to this work. Uh, so I actually, year, many years ago, worked as a service provider in New York at an organization called Safe Horizon, which is, one of, is a large victim service organization in New York City. And I served immigrant victims of domestic violence as well as human trafficking. So I litigated cases in family court and uh, represented Domestic, uh, domestic worker survivors as well as other survivors of human trafficking in their immigration proceedings and as they were going through criminal justice um, uh, trials and acting as witnesses and interacting with prosecutors and law enforcement agents. And from there I really developed, um, uh, I, I saw a lot and, and, and developed a real um, a dedication and commitment to addressing kind of the intersection of immigration and violence against women work and uh, in shifted from doing direct service work to policy work. So. Great. Now at the head of the ship I <laughs> here, um, you have two things you need to do. First, <laughs> could you introduce yourself? And after that, I would like to ask you a question specifically about IPS positions itself as a think and do tank. So what is the role of public scholarship and IPS in creating uh, movements and what do, should we be doing to support them? Great. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's great to be here with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, so I'm John Cavan. I direct IPS. I, I ran our global economy work for 15 years and then became uh, the director. And I met the National Domestic Workers Alliance before it was born. So it was, it was really you know, <laughs> when it was, um, it came out of, uh, as Samira was saying, various state and city-based groups of nannies and caregivers and domestic workers. And I was blown away both by the mission and by the audacity of it. Uh, it, was, it. It all came together about nine years ago at a US social forum under the leadership of, of Ai-jen Poo and other very creative people. And let me just say a word about NDWA, because then it will explain the kind of role 
we play. Um, I, it exists for all the reasons Samira just said, and, and one other really important one, which is it exists in part to undo a horrible piece of racism in our history, which is that in the 1930s, um, there was a massive struggle of working people for better conditions for workers in this country. And out of that struggle, millions of people, in a, in a very militant struggle, out of it, we got the pressure on the FDR administration for all the laws that we now spend a lot of time defending that give us minimum wage and maximum hours of work and so on. However, uh, those laws excluded two incredibly significant groups of people. One was domestic workers and one was farm workers. And when you think about it, um, it was because they were easy groups to include, and it was because, as Roosevelt put together the coalition to pass these laws, racist white Democrats in the South said to him, these laws don't apply to my black maid, surely. And he sat there and counted the votes and in essence said, no, of course they don't. Uh, and in the end, we have these deeply imperfect laws. And now 80 years later, the National Domestic Workers Alliance is redressing that racist wrong. Uh, and they're doing it nationally through very creative work at the Labor Department that has won some, some benefits for some domestic workers. And they're doing it at the state level with these incredible campaigns for domestic worker Bill of Rights. So who could resist an alliance with that? <laughs> um, so now just a word more on the other piece. Um, so IPS, we call what we do here public scholarship or activist scholarship, but it's based on the premise that the driving force of social change in this country and in the world will be dynamic social movements made up of people who are, who are most adversely affected by the current system. So in this case, we have partnerships with the domestic workers, with restaurant workers, with this great new coalition that's come together last week called People's Action, um, Jobs with Justice, the Climate Justice Alliance, groups that are doing this work, but a lot of it, if you will, off camera. And our role, we see our role as helping to bring in um, different things, but a lot of it is research and writing that helps illuminate their fights, um, that helps look for new coalitions that can build power to win these fights. Sometimes it's as simple as a lot of what we've been doing with NDWA are infographics that show for example, in February, when the news comes out that Wall Street is giving uh, bonuses of $25 billion to these hardworking people on Wall Street, we compare that with the fact that you could double uh, the wages of all domestic workers, get them all up to $15, and still have money over left over for the bonuses. And that's the kind of catchy thing that then you get in the media. Um, and it helps elevate the struggle. Um, so, so part of it is research. Sometimes it's policy work. Sometimes it is connections. NDWA is a master in coalition building. And sometimes we can bring others in. Um, and so I, I just want to say it's for, for that reason that we, we formed a kind of strategic partnership with NDWA and why we're also thrilled to have them uh, housed here in these offices down here, because it gives us more of an opportunity to actually uh, talk some of these things through. And it feels like the strategic partnership is very rich and rewarding and mutually beneficial for both organizations. So starting with Samir, could you guys talk about the rewarding components of working in these sort of strategic partnerships in DWA and IPS, but also some of the challenges that we confront as we try to navigate the waters? Sure. Um, I think that there have been, there's many benefits to the strategic partnership. I think that we really complement each other in um, many ways. And so for us to, the, the example of the infographic is a perfect example. We have all of the information um, and the data that, that could create this. And um, IPS offers all of the skills um, to, to help us kind of reflect of our experience. And it's really, um, something that we, uh, in our busy campaign work, uh, find it hard to kind of uh, sit down and, and do that. And so 
to complement us this way and to present it uh, for policymakers, I think is a really, really big benefit. We, as I said, we focus on organizing movement building, but we do need to be able to um, tell our story to policymakers and to the public. And I think that that is a real um, way that we complement each other. And uh, in terms of challenges, I think that this um, collaboration has had few challenges, but I think that the kind of busyness that I mentioned of our schedules and um, just wanting to touch base and having different kind of ups and downs of when we have opportunities to do that. I think that's kind of been a main challenge, but um, there's fewer that I can identify. Mm -hmm. um, collaborations and coalitions in general present challenges. I'm sure we all know them, but I think that these kinds of partnerships have actually been, um, for the most part, free of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think for me, the um, the challenge on the policy end is always when working with a movement group to make sure that you're representing the actual voices of the movement leaders, the workers, and the organizers who are um, leading the work. Because in the what I did when I was at um, when I was like embedded in NDWA is I went to a bunch of policies before they had a DC presence. So I was like the guy who like went around and did all these policy meetings. And they're so fast paced here. There's so many things going on, decisions you have to make right in the moment. And so the biggest challenge for me was how much agency can I have and how much um, am I really representing what the workers want to see in this situation. And so it took a lot of real, a lot of learning and listening. And I spent the first year in the partnership really just going to every single meeting, <laughs> meeting every worker, um, so that I could really understand what they were seeking. But I think the then on the flip side, the rewarding aspect is when you get it right. <laughs> when you get it right and you see materials that you made um, being used in meetings and being um, translated in like four languages, and you see um, workers who you've coached through some of these difficult um, explanations of policy things being able to stand up and do it, like the less I talked, the better I felt. Um, and so I think to me that was the most rewarding aspect. Well, I'll just say I, I feel uh, like zero challenges in the <laughs> sense that it's just, it's been like a gift to work with um, this group of people. Um, and I even think um, some of the things we do with other of our movement building partners, like looking for new allies, like helping with a bigger vision. And, and our work with, with NDWA, um, they supply a lot of that. Um, in a minute, we'll get into this joint coalition work we've done around a campaign called Caring Across Generations. But, but again, one where um, enormous challenge. I mean, I feel more like where we are with NDWA on the challenge part is, is what's nice is partly due to the skill of Tiffany, um, but others here at IPS. We truly are inside the DNA of, um, of NDWA. So their leaders actually can share what they're going through and, and the challenges they're going through. And there are many, you know, there. So for example, I'm on the fundraising committee of this joint campaign. And fundraising is, um, it's hard. And it's, um, it's also a bit um, uh, unpredictable. And here you are trying to build, build a big campaign where you can't be certain what the money will be. And so I feel like partly we, we, we've reached a level, um, and this is wonderful, where they can share with us what their sort of deeper fears <laughs> and challenges are, and we together um, try, to, try to solve them together. It's helped enormously, and I, I, I wonder if there's a lesson from this. Having, I, I think the word Tiffany just used, Tiffany was embedded in NDWA. So, she she became them and they became um, Tiffany and that gave us also insights and a level of trust that made getting deeper so much important and I think it's a rare thing I think it, it is rare that that a group actually has somebody who in effect Tiffany was part of both she went to our staff meetings and their staff meetings talk about a challenge <laughs> <laughs> poor Tiffany I mean it's hard very hard to do that because you're subsuming you know I mean, the good part is you get the, the successes of both. The bad part is you're feeling the weight of at any given moment when either institution is suffering a bit. It's on your shoulders. But I do think we should try to do more of that. And have, and <laughs> have, that <laughs> especially if it's not yeah, me doing it. No, no, not, I think it would be great if more institutions figured out. Like IPS right now is thinking of potentially trying to raise money with another nonprofit for a joint position. Um, 
And that's a way to then just get closer quicker. Well, hey, Tiffany, it sounds like you've assumed a lot of responsibility <laughs> on both the NDWA part and IPS, and that you've really done a lot of good work on both sides. So can you just sort of unpack your own personal experiences sure. and just talk about sort of the victory that you've encountered? Uh, sure. So um, Samira came to the work as a lawyer. I came to the work as a social worker. I um, was the case manager here at IPS doing the counseling for the domestic workers. So that's um, you know where I came in to this particular campaign. And in 2010, um, Jill Schenker, who is the, was the field director, I don't know what her title is now, but was the field director for NDWA, came to visit us. Um, and we sort of started dating as organization to organization. Like, I did a little fact sheet here and there. I like came to a meeting here and there. Um, and then we really totally got married. Um, in 2011, <laughs> um, I started working with um, some of the other domestic worker affiliate organizations who are now the anchors of the Beyond Survival campaign to talk about the challenges that they were facing to see if there was any pol if there were policy solutions that they were working on, especially federal ones, since I'm here in DC. Um, and so we started by just um, sort of gathering all of the issues, and then um, we wrote a um, a grant. I mean, this is to be honest, the 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 truth of how it hap how it can happen is you get money to do it. Um, and so we had a really generous um, grant from the um, Oak Foundation, which allowed me to work ninety percent time with NDWA embedded, as John said. Um, and so. No rebooting, please. Thank you. Um, and so I started by meeting with the workers, um, and we did a lot of retreats. We did a lot of unpacking the trauma pieces um, as well as the policy pieces for a couple of years. That was my main work. And um, and then we started doing more policy work. So again, this is an example of the collaboration. Um, I knew a bunch of what policy was internationally and federally, thanks to a bunch of research that I did. And so then we put it together with the workers' stories. And um, in 2015, we published this uh, report, which was 150 pages. <laughs> there is an executive summary, which you can get on domesticworkers.org slash beyond survival. Um, but this report is basically the culmination of the sort of startup years where I was embedded. So it's the um, a bunch of stories of the workers, the sort of overview of the federal and the international policies, a bunch of recommendations, and some key principles that we worked out um, with the worker groups about some of their um, core values and everything else that really just have has them in the forefront and leading this work, but backed up by a whole infrastructure of policy recommendations underneath. Um, and so in, that was in January 2015, and then two months after that, I was promoted here to <laughs> associate director. So I was really happy to pass over the reins to Samira, because Samira had already been working on this issue, as she said, and was leading the policy work for the immigration campaign. And a lot of what we talk about in Beyond Survival is that human trafficking is completely connected to immigration rights and labor rights. It's not a sort of victim perpetrator phenomenon that is um, solely isolated in the criminal justice field, but in fact has these reverberations throughout all of the other work that NDWA was. And Samira is a policy expert on all that other work. So she took it over, and it's really great. <laughs> Absolutely. And just so you guys all know, Beyond Survival is incredible. You'll never find a better mix <laughs> of storytelling as well as policy recommendation both on like a wide broad federal level as well as just like minutia of state and local level laws so my hat's off to you in <laughs> DWA. <laughs> but yeah. one question for you Samir, um, could you talk more about the current campaign for human trafficking as well as immigration? I'm sure a lot of us want to hear more about the gender analysis that you guys are putting on that and also like what is next? And then can you also talk about ways that APS and NDWA could possibly collaborate in the future and looking forward? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as Tiffany mentioned, Beyond Survival is uh, powered by our affiliates. And we actually have grown in the past year. And now we have six affiliates that work on our campaign. And they're located in Massachusetts, New York, the DC area. El Paso, Texas, and San Francisco, or the Bay Area in California. And so we kind of expanded the geographic base that represents um, the campaign. And so we also are starting to see um, a more complex and a diverse range of 
trafficking scenarios and stories that our survivors have experienced. Um, a lot of the work of the campaign has been focused on the A3G5 diplomat trafficking um, cases that originally um, led to the formation of the campaign, but now we're seeing kind of a wider scope of what our affiliates are, are seeing with the workers that they're working with. So we're kind of in this conversation about how can we think about our policy goals to really cover all of the broad range of um, survivors. And so we kind of have really honed in on four very specific goals for our campaign. Um, first is to develop the leadership of survivors. So we're really working on developing survivors as spokeswomen. Um, we're doing kind of communication, in-depth communications training, in-depth training about advocacy, um, and just the building a space for uh, survivors sharing storytelling and resilience building. Um, and then our second goal is to shift the narrative about trafficking so that um, there is a recognition of the prevalence of labor trafficking and especially the role that the, the domestic worker industry plays um, in the prevalence of labor trafficking. Um, we're also working to uh, expand and build the capacity of our affiliates. As I mentioned, we have 53 affiliates. So to build their capacity to respond to trafficking, um, a lot of our affiliates uh, are working on a multitude of issues and they come upon a survivor of trafficking and uh, can learn from the expertise that the affiliates on the campaign have developed in terms of, we recently had kind of a technical assistance call where one of our affiliates that um, has not worked on trafficking cases heard of a domestic worker that is trapped in a home and locked up and they don't know what to do and they want to do an outreach. And so we had a technical assistance call where the others who have had this experience did kind of like a safety plan and like tips on how to approach the situation to ensure the worker's safety and that the worker can access information that could be key to her, um, to her um, finding, uh, being free from the situation. And then the fourth goal is to win federal policy um, changes, both at the legislative and administrative level. Um, we've actually been working in collaboration with Polaris to kind of put together a set of legislative asks um, for the reauthorization of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which will be next year. And that piece of federal legislation is kind of the main avenue for us to get um, uh, uh, greater federal protections for survivors. So um, we are, you know, we're engaging, we're getting geared up for this federal legislative campaign that will really, um, I think, involve survivors at the helm. So we're, we're planning for them to come and lobby legislators, mm -hmm. planning for them to, um, to uh, provide the stories that, um, that, that will show why the policy changes are so necessary. Um, we are hoping to kind of, as I said, um, diversify and expand our asks so that we can um, uh, have asks that complement the kind of diplomat trafficking cases that we've been working on. And as um, Tiffany mentioned, there is a lot of crossover. Our Beyond Survival does try to kind of address gender equity, racial justice, immigration reform, as well as worker protections, because we feel like they all are the solutions to ending trafficking. Um, so we do have a lot of crossover with our immigration campaign, which is We Belong Together, as I mentioned, mobilizes women around the country for immigration um, policies that will benefit women. So right now, We Belong Together, um, along with the immigrant rights movement, is kind of in this um, position where we're waiting for the Supreme Court to issue a decision about the future of President Obama's executive action program, the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Legal Permanent Residents, DAPA, um, which would provide immigration relief to close to 5 million members of the undocumented community. And that is a form of relief that women in our campaign have fasted, taken arrest, um, uh, shared their stories and put that put their bodies on the line for that kind of um, for that relief. I mean, obviously, the first choice would have been legislative um, solution, but that not being possible in this Congress, um, the president's executive actions was a hard fought campaign, and so um, we are very interested in defending it and implementing it. So we are, you know, hoping that the Supreme Court will do the right thing and that we will. Um, we will be able to work on implementing the program. So that entails um, families being comfortable with 
coming out of the shadows and and presenting their information to immigration, which is a very scary thing, especially given the climate of um, really harsh enforcement and um, resources devoted to immigration enforcement. And recently, families have been there have been raids on families, including small children, women, and children that are fleeing violence in Central America are detained in family detention facilities. So the atmosphere for coming forward is very challenging. Um, so we're doing a lot of work to educate our affiliates um, to provide them with the resources so that they can help implement this program once it gets underway. Um, and as I mentioned, we um, there's a lot of enforcement. So we're also um, trying to fight the po those policies and make it um, uh, ensure that the needs of women who are survivors of violence can feel free uh, feel that they can report um, crimes like domestic violence or sexual assault even though um, law enforcement in many times is collaborating with immigration, which kind of makes it impossible for them to do so. And that you know, women workers can assert their labor rights, um, uh, domestic workers or women workers generally. So we are trying to fight, uh, continue our fight for enforcement reforms. Um, and in terms of collaborating with um, IPS, uh, recently we've had a conversation about some um, uh, ways that we want to document the data that we have um, uncovered about labor trafficking. I think, I mean, I'm sure at Polaris you find that this to be true, that there is, it's very hard to come upon um, reliable and competent data about um, uh, trafficking in the United States. And so what we're hoping to do is put together um, the data that we've collected on domestic worker um, trafficking and kind of have that um, as something that we, um, that'll help us in our legislative and other advocacy campaigns. Um, and so I'm hoping that IPS will help us with that. And uh, I think that that's in the cards for us. Mm -hmm. So we're very lucky. And um, and there's a lot of other um, research that we're hoping to uncover about the barriers that women face in terms of access, accessing different forms of immigration relief to make sure that women are not disparately um, left out of uh, accessing DAPA because of those particular barriers and so that they are addressed by policymakers. So those are a couple of projects mm -hmm. that we are hoping to journey on. Absolutely. And one final question to John before we open up to the audience or the panelists ask the audience questions. <laughs> um, may, John, could you just talk a little bit more about other than IPS who are working with NWA, NDWA and what sort of work is coming out of us and, and what should we be doing in the future to help support the work this year is done. Yeah, sure, and and I'll be brief because it would be great to have a chance for a conversation. I do just want one thing on Samira's last point on this great coalition on immigrant rights of women. Uh, we belong together. I just want to note for some of you I know are watching this, but the woman who was the first national chair of this is now uh, running for Congress in, in the state of Washington, Pramila mm -hmm. Jayapal. Um, and I look around the room and I see several of you who worked on Jamie Raskin's campaign here. There are three or four very interesting, prominent progressives with a broad agenda running. And I just would say, Pramila, uh, if you don't know her, check, check it out. Because mm -hmm. it, it would be, boy, would that be an interesting member of Congress. And, and she's got a shot at it um, coming out of that. So yeah, just two quick things on our work. One, um, we have a black workers initiative at IPS led by someone named Mark Baird. Uh, and uh, Mark and Alicia Garza from NDWA are diving a bit into the racist history of those uh, labor laws, especially in, in a couple of two to three southern states. The other one, um, and this is just so, so to be honest, I mean, I know you all come from different parts of progressive organizations, but one of our great weaknesses in the progressive movements is that we, we do things uh, sort of by ourselves in our own area. And we seldom look creatively for new campaigns, new ways of thinking that would connect us with unusual allies. The person, the two people who I think I know who do this most creatively are the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Ai Fu, and a woman who's on our board here at IPS, Sarita Gupta, who's the head of Jobs with Justice. And about six years ago, both of them started talking to us about a rather bold idea, um, which was their observation um, that, that the US was probably number 196 uh, in the world. And there's only 196 countries. So <laughs> this mm -hmm. was a bold statement in elder care and how we treat our elders. We stink. 
And, and partly I think their observation came from their upbringing in uh, immigrant families that are actually much better at it. It, it. Aging in most countries is aging with your families, it's aging with intergenerational respect, it's, it's a different thing. It's not great everywhere and in poor countries it's more challenging, but we, we're terrible at it. And so, and they also just noted that we were entering an, a, a, a crisis, what they came to call a care crisis, because we have more and more, we have eight people reaching the age of 65, one person recent, reaching the age of 65 every eight seconds. And we're about to have a crisis of who's going to take care of, um, of older folks. So they dreamed up an idea that has become a very dynamic campaign with, with well, well over 100 groups participating um, called Caring Across Generations. And just the, the simple story of it is in Igen's book called The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. But, but just, I won't get into what it does so much as the audacity of it. What they said is, could you imagine, I mean, their, their sense of the crisis was we don't have enough workers. Um, the ones we have aren't necessarily trained to do it as well as they could. Many of them doing it need a path to citizenship. Um, and uh, a lot of older people who are poorer can't afford it. And especially if you win the worker rights, if, and the women aren't making much. Mainly women, mainly people of color, many of them immigrants, um, don't make enough. And if you won that, they're making more than you've got a lot of elder people who are just above, say, the Medicaid um, cutoff who would have trouble affording it and who might even fight against the worker rights. What if you put the elder folks together with the workers, together with healthcare groups, together with experts on this issue, together with disability rights groups, and you said several hundred of our groups together, let's fight to transform elder care in this country. So that's what Caring Across Generations is. We're on the leadership team of it, we help with fundraising, and the one other thing I'll just mention we do right now, they are fighting, um, as Samira and uh, Tiffany mentioned, it's kind of hard to pass things through Congress right now, in case you didn't notice. Um, but they have done this epic fight uh, to get some of those basic rights that were denied to a lot of workers in the 30s to home health care workers. Epic fight. Uh, that's in the Department of Labor. Again, so you can do a lot in a Department of Labor is just a fascinating realm of struggle, if you will, <laughs> run, run uh, by Hilda Solis and now Tom Perez, two of the most dynamic cabinet people of the last generation. Um, and then they're trying to win um, some things now in several states. So here's a piece that IPS is helping with very concretely there. They're starting with Hawaii, which, you know, keep in mind, Hawaii is a state that has 74% people of color, many of them immigrants or children of immigrants. They're Japanese Americans and you know, Filipino Americans and so on. They, they know about elder care <laughs> better than we do. They are a big campaign to pass comprehensive uh, long-term care insurance in Hawaii. This is beginning now in several other states. Right now, if you're older and all of a sudden you run into problems and it costs a lot of money, you're screwed in this country. And you can't afford uh, long-term care insurance because it's so expensive for most people. Um, so the question is, how do you pay for it? IPS is very good at how, how do you pay for it. We've got more ideas on how to fairly tax the 1% corporations and Wall Street than anybody else. Uh, so if you ever want to know about that, come to us. And we're trying to match it in this case. There are openings in states like Washington that are different than Hawaii, that are different from California. How do you match those and what would be a revenue source that could win in a campaign? The campaign, by the way, won't be about taxing people. Nobody likes campaigns about taxing people. <laughs> the campaign's about how do we get long-term comprehensive uh, you know, care insurance to the people who need it. Um, and so we're on that committee. And I'll just end with one thing um, that I've loved in the Caring Across Generations world. Maybe a year ago, uh, Igen and Sarita convened a meeting with the pe people like from the federal government, from academia, who've been working for 40 years and knew exactly how to do this. We know how to do this. Um, and they've been putting proposals forward, reports, and everything for 40 years, but waiting for a movement that could build power to win it. So it, we're not, there's no shortage of good ideas out there. We've got the solutions to most of the problems in the world. We just haven't built the power to win them. 
And they sat there, one of them cried as he spoke, he'd been working in the federal government for 40 years on these ideas, looking at this movement, this movement that can win this in Hawaii, in California, if you win it in several places, you then have the argument to, to make it go national. Um, and so I just, it, it, for those of you who don't know it, there's a fabulous website also full of storytelling. A lot of this is a culture change campaign. It's not just a policy campaign. Um, check it out and join us. Wow, well, fabulous. So <laughs> now moving on to our next portion of the, uh, of the program, we'd like to open the floor to anyone in the audience who has burning questions they want to ask. I know I have some, but I want to see if anybody else has them. And if there's anything you guys want to ask, You said you call it the domestic worker industry, and I have always thought of it as very ad hoc. You know, I hire a housekeeper from Peru who may or may not be legal. You hire somebody to take care of your mom who may or may not be legal. Uh, my neighbor who works for the whole World Bank gets somebody on this visa program. I know that with Agricultural workers, there are sort of systems and networks that bring in lots of people. And with sex workers, there are illegal networks that bring in lots of beautiful women from Eastern Europe. It is, is this organized in the way that these other things are, or is it a more ad hoc industry? Uh, well, maybe you can take it. So, um, in one of the biggest challenges that is like very, it, in many places, it's very gray market exactly what you're saying is a little bit ad hoc. But I will say that surprisingly, the number of women who come over on the work visas or um, like the H or the J visa or the A visa or the B visa or any of these, um, are, we can reach them. The government can reach them. Organizers could reach them if the government would let us. Um, and so there's a lot of preventative work that could happen. Um, and they're not the only ones. Like when we're talking about nannies and, and housekeepers, that's true. Um, but in home care, there are um, there are agencies, and they are represented by the International Franchise Association, who lobbies the, con the Chamber of Commerce to prevent any protective rules from coming into place. So, depending on which kind of domestic worker, yeah, there could be um, more gray or ad hoc versus more organized, but I think that's what NDWA would be trying to do, is reach everybody so that there is a system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the challenges of our sector, is that the workplace, our domestic workers' workplaces are people's private homes. So there is um, the challenge of isolated workplaces and isolation that the workers um, often have to, often experience. But I think there's also a shift in the in the way that domestic workers are contracted and engaged, especially with technology. You have like a, a website like care.com, which has millions of employers and workers um, that um, engage in um, services that way. So it is also a shifting um, shifting, and that's also another opportunity for organizing and reaching more workers, and also employers, to educate employers on what a fair workplace is for a domestic worker. I mean, I just read that, I think it was in the Washington Post yesterday, maybe it was about the test. And they said, like, in Washington, D.C., about $22,000 a year. Now, if you were significantly increase the pay to daycare providers, first of all, people can't afford the $22,000 now. In other words, it seems it's much more of a systemic problem than just, you've got to, you know, get the weight and stuff for these group of workers and get them a little bit better. I mean, I've said this a million times, and it's a fundamental flaw in the whole capitalist system. <laughs> we have to sometimes begin to think about and address. It's good to do these things and put a little band aid on this problem and cure somewhere else, but it's a much more fundamental systemic problem about what we do with the resources we have available. Yeah, um, this, by the way, from the library, the best library that I've ever seen was the Library of Occupy DC, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> put together by this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder where all those volumes are, <laughs> you may know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and you know, it's interesting, part of, I'd say, the fun conversation that goes on between IPS and NDWA and others is, um, here we are in these very concrete fights that especially Samira and Tiffany just described. And yet we know the bigger challenge is systemic and, and much bigger. 
and how can we create a conversation with our allies that gets you to the bigger systemic conversation? I'd say right now, I mean, just speaking for myself, I feel that the Bernie Sanders campaign has raised some of those larger systemic issues, and the climate movement has raised some of the larger systemic issues, and the movement for black lives has raised bigger systemic issues around structural racism. So we're in a moment where, as you know, people are not afraid anymore of the word socialism, which is a systemic term. Um, and so, uh, wow. And I think the fun challenge for us, it's interesting, NDWA, I would say, is part of a much broader set of groups that have been working for this very fundamental right for people to get paid enough to live in dignity, the so-called fight for 15, um, which at its heart is not a systemic fight. It's about, it's saying people deserve to live in dignity. And one of our bigger issues here at IPS is, so here's, here's the thing, I mean, talk about uh, a movement that has motion and is, is really got, captured the national attention and changed the story. The vast majority of Americans agree now that people should make enough to live in dignity. Um, but if you think bigger systemically, um, this guy Thomas Piketty, uh, the capital guy, pointed out that even if you did that, um, inequality would grow uh, uh, through the roof. So one of the interesting, more systemic conversations we're in with our allies is, um, could you imagine the fight for 15 evolving into something that's got a bring the top down part to it? And the NDWA stuff has that built in because if you're fighting to pay for comprehensive long-term care, for example, um, you're paying, for, we're saying pay for it and make the system better and different and fairer at the same time by taxing uh, inheritance, by taxing financial, uh, as Bar Bernie calls it, Wall Street speculation. And so, we're putting into the campaigns um, issues that I think allow us to talk about the bigger, the bigger structural problems. I don't, you know, know how. Well, the, the their political education that domestic workers do. I mean, I only worked on the trafficking piece. Well, I worked on a couple of other things, but the political education that they do for the workers includes this kind of conversation about globalization and migration, since that's part of the stories of many of the workers. And um, the strategy is never like villainizing the employers. I mean, unless they're really, really, really bad. But usually what it is, is like, okay, well, you can't afford it either. Um, and so who can? <laughs> and then IPS says, oh, we can find it somewhere. <laughs> um, and that's the strategy <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> I mean, I think the reason that the culture change work is so important is because, mm -hmm. you know, even though it's like 22K for childcare, that workforce is, I'm, I'm sure, extremely, for the most part, exploited and underpaid. And it's a workforce that's women, black women, women other women of color. So that the work of that workforce has historically been undervalued and exploited. So I think that's where the culture shift work comes in, that this is a work that you want qualified workers that can live in dignity to pro provide care to our loved ones. And, and just want to this for all of our work. I'm, you know, uh, President Obama will get up and say, look at what I've done for the economy and it's growing again and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think part of the reason why we are as close to the ND National Domestic Workers Alliance and the restaurant workers is that most of the fastest growing, quote, professions in the United States are the lowest paying ones. And they're what Samira and Tiffany have just described in domestic work and they're in restaurant work. And therefore, uh, and that's, if that's the future for, if, if with, we've got to transform those jobs and make them dignified, uh, allow the, the women doing them to live in dignity. Um, but that's part of the systemic problem. That's, if that's the future and also short-term contingent, uh, you know, part-time work, um, we've got a problem in terms of that power imbalance. That gives more and more power to the corporations that are driving so much of the economy. So if the domestic workers and restaurant workers can get power with allies, and with parts of organized labor uh, as allies, um, then we can challenge uh, the bigger system. Sure, maybe one or two more questions if anyone has. So, Samira, I want to go back to something that you had said about trying to collect data, or trying to try to collect data about trafficking and so forth. How do you move sort of beyond the story of Kevin and anecdotal? Um, and create a pool of data that policymakers would be credible. I mean, is it tapping into existing data, like all coming into the hotline, or visa, or you know, 
So we, the, the six affiliates that work on the campaign are actually um, real experts and have real expertise in trafficking, especially domestic worker trafficking. And so, but they haven't had the opportunity to actually present um, uh, the work that they've done and the expertise they've developed in the number of cases that they've worked on and presented that publicly. So basically what we're hoping for is collecting the data, their experiences, the number of cases they've worked on, the law enforcement agencies that they've advocated with, um, how they've developed survivor leadership, putting together the data that we can collect through their work and then and, and then presenting that. And, and we think that that actually is very reflective because um, they are kind of on the front lines of working with survivors. So, um, so that's the data that we're looking at, the ones that we have within that we just haven't, you know, collected and presented. Yeah. One final question. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about you know, how you see your statement and given the situation in Congress. We, as I mentioned, uh, our state campaigns are a real key component of the campaign work that we do, um, and we have been successful in expanding rights for domestic workers in um, the six states that I listed before. And now we're really working on um, ensuring enforcement of the rights that we've gained. And so uh, we are also uh, looking in other states like Illinois. We have a really active campaign in Illinois um, right now to also uh, win a bill of rights for domestic workers there. And then also we're thinking about strategies for blue cities and red states to see if it's possible to make some gains in the south or other places where state strategies also are very challenging mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah and th and those campaigns have been an amazing opportunity um, to mobilize workers and um, and the leadership and the storytelling and the skill development that the workers in involved in those campaigns have um, brought to the table are just amazingly powerful and have been what have won those victories. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of states, we're also defending some of the victories. Um, Tiffany, I think, alluded to kind of the au pair agencies mm -hmm. that are really fighting in Connecticut and Massachusetts. They're trying to win, ex they're trying to get exclusions to say that au pairs shouldn't be protected under the Bill of Rights. So we still are actively in, in uh, protecting our wins in the states that we've gotten them. So our state work is pretty key to, to what we're doing. And just maybe one, one other thing about that, because it's, uh, I think, such a great lesson for everybody's campaigns. Um, and Samira, I know you have to slip out. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. I have to get yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Feel free to reach out to me <laughs> if there's any other yeah. questions. Thanks, yeah. Samira. Yeah. Um, yeah, just one more thing on the, on the state work. Um, I actually did meet IGEN and, and the predecessor for the National Domestic Workers Alliance when they were fighting for the New York State uh, bill on, on rights for, for domestic workers. Um, it took her and them 13 years to win that. And she'd call up and say, can you get Barbara Ehrenreich up to Albany? <laughs> and then she'd call and say, can you get John Sweeney, who was then the head of the AFL-CIO, up to Albany? And it was... Um, it was this slog, and you'd fight it, and you'd be on the verge of winning, and then there'd be an election, and the House would go, you know, to, you know, new Republicans would be elected. And but once they won it in one place, um, they then had the model for these other states. And um, I think our feeling is so. If you look around the country now, there's I think 11 states now. I could be wrong, but that have Democratic governors and and legislatures. So you can win a lot with the right model. And if you can then show it's working, show that it's not bankrupting, uh, say, the, the people who, who hire um, and employ domestic workers, you then do have an argument for, um, for something bigger and more comprehensive. And I, I just say that the one other piece of this, back to your gridlock Congress, is um, 
the folks here are very conscious that you we won't win this nationwide if it becomes a partisan thing. Um, and a lot of elder people are Democrats and a lot are Republicans and a lot aren't very engaged. But um, I think some of the most creative work has been with um, uh, groups of that are organized around elder uh, folks issues in states that aren't particularly blue, like Florida, which has been an in-between state. And getting those folks involved and getting them fighting for it. So the, the, I, I think the vision isn't just that we'll get the 11 states that are gettable because they're democratic everything. It's that this is an issue that appeals to everyone. And if you put it in terms of dignity, if you put it in terms of, I mean, this is the one organization I know of that uses the term love. Uh, this is about organizing for love. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> and I, I will say, I've, um, you know, you get into a room with some hardened trade union people and you talk about organizing for love. And it's, it's you know, it's a little bit awkward sometimes at the beginning. And, and But I've watched many of them get won over uh, to that. It's the notion. parent chair. <laughs> there you go. So um, that we, we've got, I think, in a, in a country that's likely gridlocked in Congress for a while longer, um, we, we've got a, our... We've got the states, we've got the blue cities and red states, and then we've got some more if, if it is framed around issues that appeal to everybody. Can we have a round of applause for that? <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, Mark Priester, too. I, just, I, I know Mark Priester works on both our Black Workers Initiative and our economy work, and is, is a great example. Um, IPS is pouring a lot of our energy now into mentoring the next generation of public scholars. Um, and, you know, I mean, you sort of see the leadership of these movements, I just want to say, is largely young, at least from my perspective. They're between 30 and 40. They're largely people of color. They're largely women. It's, it's a, and think of the leadership of the progressive movement who are, you know, 55 and older. It's largely white men. So there is a dynamic leadership emerging that is more representative of what the country has become and is becoming. And um, there's incredible people like Mark Priester who are now part of that. And so if you ever get down, just think about that. I mean, think about, look at who's, you know, look at the young people jumping in on the bigger system change conversation and, and look at Mark Priester. <laughs> and, just, you know, feel good about the future. <laughs> Thanks, and Mark. I'm to <laughs> two housekeeping um, things. Uh, if you did not receive a little handout when you came in about upcoming events, uh, you can grab one on the way out. We will be having more of these brown bag sessions as we progress from the spring to the summertime. And if you are interested in radical change, <laughs> if you're interested in labor of love, you need to fill out our questionnaire. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that, that is also at the front. Please fill that out. It helps us realize what sort of events, what sort of talking points the public wants to hear, and it helps IPS create a more dynamic media voice. So please and thank you. One final round of applause for our panelists.